Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Chris Bircher, and I am the Neurodivergent Professor. I podcast, make videos, and write articles about what it's like being different in a world that's sort of designed for people that like to conform. When I was a kid, I always wanted something like this. You know, I always wanted somebody to tell me that it was okay. Not to tell me that I was special or gifted or any of the things that I heard, but just to be like, you know what, everybody's weird, and uh, let's just roll with it. Uh, at some point in my life, I started telling myself that there are two types of people in the world. It's funny to think about. You know, people who admit that they're weird and roll with it, and people who try to pretend like they're not. And I, I really think it's kind of that simple. Uh, but today, this is episode 163, and what I want to talk about is how neurodivergent people can learn healthy boundaries. A couple of shout-outs. One to my friend Sophie, who's been helping me with learning Instagram uh, to sort of share this stuff and, um, in a better way, in a more effective way. You know, you can't be good at everything. Not that I'm good at, all, at everything by any means, but I just can't wrap my head around how to navigate social media. It's super meaningful uh, to have help doing this, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that, Sophie. Thank you. And then secondly, to my sister, who's one of the, uh, who just had a long, nice conversation with, kind of about our aging parents uh, in a very mature way, and it's it's such a blessing to have siblings that are so much older than me. They're 11, 12 years older than me, and, 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 and growing up, for most of my life, that was kind of a weird thing, because I was really kind of felt like an only child with these family members I didn't really know that well. But now they offer me a lot of insight into the aging process. And if there's one, there's a lot of things that humans struggle with and suck at. And one of the things we suck at big time is knowing what aging is like. We don't share it. We don't talk about it. We don't listen to it. We don't want to hear it. And uh, it's fascinating to me to have that the, a, a, kinder, a kindred um capacity to be informed, right? She can tell me about things, and and I know it's particularly meaningful because we're so much alike. Um, it's also pretty interesting that we grew up in the same family, but our parents were very different people in the decades that they parented them, and, and as my sister also said, she had my brother. They were about the same age to grow up with, and I was more alone. Uh, but she, she asked me a question about boundaries and sort of how I knew I was neurodivergent. It wasn't about boundaries. It was really talking about being neurodivergent in my particular flavor or archetype that I think might exist out there of being an over-analytical, overly intellectual, uh, hyper-vigilant, extra-sensory type neurodivergent. You know, my, my problem with what I've explained to her is that I get all the information on 11 from everywhere all the time, and it's really hard for me to discriminate or make any decision about what to pay attention to. And I know it sounds a lot like ADHD, right? But I actually don't, or I don't really test high in that. Um, maybe that's, I look at that more like we have the science wrong, not because I'm messed up. Uh, but I'm trying to to, to, to to interpret the information, and it's just, A, it's overwhelming, and it's too much, and B, I, ha I have no way of sorting through it because it's all this at the same volume. <laughs> it's all extra loud. And another example that might illustrate this more, which incidentally happened like an hour before this conversation with my sister, my wife said, which yoga video do you want to watch today? We're going to do yoga together. We've been doing it together for a while, and I love it. Um, and we watch a show called Yoga with Cassandra, and there's like, I don't know, a thousand videos, right? And I always have trouble deciding which one, and it's that, you know, it's the process. It's the analysis paralysis. It's the imposter syndrome. It's all of my neuroses at once. And she said, which one do you want to watch? And I'm like, okay, okay, i got to verbalize this. I have no idea which video I want to watch because, one, there's so many of them, and there's so much stimulation, and there's so much baggage associated with that question. Will I make the right one? How do I know if this is the one I want to watch? Right? The, the, the sensory thing just goes off the charts and puts me in, a, in that fight or flight or freeze kind of mode. Too much information does not compute. And then secondarily, the only mechanism I have for helping me make the decision, like I could say, this is what I want. I want X. 
Then I have to go into the YouTube page and look through all the videos until I find X. And then I have to say, well, does she really mean the same thing about X that I do? Or is she talking about a different kind of X? And then I go through that whole practice. So to me, it's an unsolvable problem. The question, what do you want, doesn't make any difference because it's unanswerable. And there's no way to guarantee that I'm going to be able to match my want up with what there is available. And I know that's like a long way to go, but maybe that is like the three-minute you know, uh, uh, presentation I would give to someone that they were saying, are you sure you're neurodivergent? <laughs> that's what I wrestle with. And I know that's a very particular flavor, and that kind of it embodied all at once. But so when we were talking about boundaries, this is my problem. I can't form any boundaries because I don't know where to make them. I get... The infinite sensory information from the world about all the different issues, whatever it is. Well, how am I feeling about this person? Infinite, overwhelming amounts of information with no clear way to draw a boundary because there's no indication that any part of it is any different. It's all super high volume. It's all loud as crap. And it's all exhausting. Plus... I don't trust the information itself to be accurate, and I don't trust my capacity to explain my story about what it is, and I know that I'm never going to be able to match up my current need with whatever's available so that I know that I'm putting that boundary in the right place. Then on top of all that, what really started my neurodivergent adventure is as I start to interact with people in the outer world, <clears throat> they have a completely different neurology than me and a completely different set of deeds and a completely different way of interpreting all the sensory information and a completely different definition of what the language, the words mean that we're using to talk about it. So there's no, I, I have to consider that. What if I drew a boundary and said, I just don't want to talk to this person. Well, I'm immediately flooded with the sensory information out there that says, well, this person may have a negative reaction to that, and they may act like this, and that may feel like this. And I realize, you know, that's basic cognitive behavioral therapy, predicting the future, forecasting, catastrophic thinking, black and white thinking. Yeah, I'm doing all of them in split seconds for every piece of information that's coming into my nervous system at any given time. So yeah, what do you what do you want to what do you want to do? <laughs> what do you where do you want to go eat dinner? Those types of questions invite the preceding six minutes worth of experience for me. And so <laughs> going back a little bit, when I was in therapy, before any of this uh, idea of how how hyper vigilant my nervous system either I've trained it to be or is biologically, probably a combination of the way I grew up and the type of biology that I have. I learned about the cognitive behavioral stuff, the, the basic Freudian, Jungian, you know, all the basic talk therapies of just saying, you, did, you know, made some decisions in your life about how the world works with good reason. You know, I could also take an internal family systems lens, which is a lot less psychoanalytical and more experiential. Both of the things lead to the same way that sort of say, you don't know what boundaries are. And because you don't have any boundaries, people are able to influence you in lots of ways. And you never end up knowing what you want, knowing what you need, knowing how to communicate those things so that you get these basic needs met. And it... In the worst, in a further, so that's just one thing people can do, is maybe not get their needs met. Maybe I didn't get to go see the movie that I wanted to see because I didn't understand how to put boundaries up and say, I don't like horror movies or whatever it is, and that's pretty benign. But it can become codependency where, kind of what I struggle with, if you wanted to paint it from a psychotherapeutic lens, I, don't, I can't differentiate my own personal needs from the needs of others. You know, so when I say I don't know what I want, that puts a light bulb off in a classically trained psychoanalytical uh, therapist, counselor, social worker to say, oh, you have codependency issues. You lack knowledge of yourself and all these other things. And so I learned, oh, oh, these are about my beliefs. My beliefs say, kind of the punchline of this episode is, you know, people won't love me or will abandon me 
or will ignore me or will just think poorly about me as a person unless I don't have any boundaries and do whatever it is they want from me. Because I did learn that in my my household, you know, my needs interrupted everybody else's day and were kind of a giant pain in the ass. And so if I didn't need things, the day went more smoothly. And so that's definitely a, a part of this. But not being able to differentiate it was what, what I was being taught in therapy was how to differentiate these things and how to change my belief system and say, no, 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 no. Look, the last time you did this, this person continued to love you. You can have a disagreement with your parents and they still love you. You can have a disagreement with your girlfriend and they'll still love you. They won't abandon you. This happens every day. You're just not used to it. You need to get used to it. It's kind of like exposure therapy. And eventually you'll change that belief in, in your head that allows you to say, well, I, I want this and therefore I'm going to do it. Like, what do you guys want to eat for dinner? You know what? I want shark tongue. And damn it, that's what we're going to have. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, but, you know, that's, I guess, the kind of thing you have when you have really strong boundaries. It protects your needs and ensures that you're going to get your needs met. You don't become a codependent and lose yourself, which eventually leads to, I think, what I became in my first marriage is a doormat, where people can literally play with you in an abusive way for kicks because you literally will never fight back and never insert your needs or, or, or be assertive about the things that you want uh, or whatever it is. You're always going with the flow. You're always rolling with things. But it's not that simple because when I, when I couldn't do it, when I couldn't see the world that way, you know, as a result of lots of different therapies, all kind of teaching me the same thing multiple times and especially in the early stages. And then with IFS doing it in a different kind of way, nothing in my knee jerk nervous system was changing, right? I never became comfortable putting myself first because I still couldn't resolve the fact that there's me and my stuff and you and your stuff and them and their stuff and all of the information in the world. And how do we know what's right? And how do we know what feels the best? Especially when we're still looking at something that's going to happen in the future. And we don't really know. Maybe we don't have... It's a very complicated world. It doesn't make any sense to me that I can just say, my needs are just as valuable, therefore I can act this way. It's, that is never going to be as strong as the feeling of all of my nervous system being stimulated at, at the same time, right? You gotta put in, you, you gotta put in drugs, right? especially uh, cannabis and alcohol, those things kind of dampen <laughs> my nervous system and make it easier for me to make those decisions. And I'm going to do an episode about this in the future, but, you know, that ain't healthy <laughs> because you're just kicking the can down the road, right? Eventually, you're going to have to make come to terms with these things because eventually those things are going to become bigger problems than the solutions that they offer or you're simply not going to be able to do them anymore and you're going to be to completely unequipped to navigate life. You can't make, become, be an alcoholic forever or it'll kill you unless I mean, maybe that's what you want. So the point is when I was unable to make traditional talk therapy strategies work and when I was even I looking down the IFS road, I love IFS. I could, but it, the way I look at it, I need to do it almost daily <laughs> And I just couldn't afford to pay $130, $150 a pop to have an hour session with someone that could help me with IFS on a regular enough basis. I'm sorry. I, I have too many money mindset issues. You know, maybe, and plus it's an hour a day, and plus it's exhausting, and, and, and I just didn't see that as a pathway. It was super helpful, and it got me a long, long way down the road. So both of those things, like I said in my... What, what this neurodivergent dude uh, learned from therapy, gained from therapy over a decade, I got a lot out of it. I understand what boundaries are, even though maybe I didn't verbalize it as well as I could have. There's plenty of work out there um, to, that you can reference uh, easily if you want to do m learn about that uh, more specifically, with more detail. Um, I did, and I, and I get it, and that I experience it in my body that, yeah, if I actually, uh, you know, maybe I can't, intellectualize and analyze myself into a space where I can change my beliefs 
if I do somatic work where my body feels it at the same time that my brain is processing it, I get a little bit further down the road of my of my sensory percent my sensory network, my CNS, my central nervous system sort of getting behind it, but it still doesn't stop my vigilant sensory receptors from behaving the way that they behave. I'm still going to take in all of the information. It's still going to be difficult to discriminate among signals that are all turned up to the same volume. It's I can't get in and manipulate my receptors down, but you know, so 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 what what can I do, right? Am I just screwed? No. And that's the whole point of this episode. That's a halfway through the episode to go to sort of demonstrate the problem. But I actually have found uh, completely uh, by by taking the vice, advice of other people, of practicing things multiple times and kind of banging my head against the wall, quite honestly. Because if you don't get... Um, if if an action doesn't produce the desired reaction and you keep doing it, you know, that's kind of like what Einstein is, is, is quoted as saying is the definition of insanity, right? Trying to same, use the same logic to get you out of a problem that you got into or to keep doing the same thing with it, expecting a different result is insanity. But sometimes you've got to try things multiple times. It's like I took the autism test multiple times, several times, twice, three times, saw that I was scoring high and ignored it <laughs> before I took them and then was able to look at it with a op- more open mind and sort of say, well, let's just consider for a minute <laughs> that this might be meaningful. Um, so when I talk about the things that I've done that I think help with my boundaries, it's not going to make any sense. And remember, it didn't make any sense to me upon trying it multiple times. And the short of this is... Um, you know, because for people that have what I consider to be like the hypervigilant neurodivergent archetype, still developing this stuff, but that 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 express it like me, that feel like they're they're receiving so much information at any given time that it's overwhelming. Where of course I guess the opposite could be true too, where you just sort of like dull it all down and ignore it all or, or yeah I think we I think we deal with this a lot of different ways and I think at its basic core one of the elements of neurodiversity is just having a differentially behaving uh, uh, or you know d- tweaked differently nervous system so anyway th- this is the, the the kind where you, f- you feel too much <laughs> you know like a hi- hypervigilant empath INFJ highly sensitive person all these people will fit into it I've been able to do it with what I've called in former episodes, which I'll cite in the show notes, my practice. Which I mentioned before, I didn't really understand the meaning of that word. I thought it was stupid when doctors say, this is my practice. It's like, you should have figured this out before you're starting to do brain surgery on me. Uh, I don't want you practicing (laughs) what you're doing. But a practice is something that we do every day that, kind of like what I mentioned before, it might not have the expected results, but we know it's good for us and we know that we're doing it so that in the in the event that we need it, it'll show up, right? Not it's sort of like, well, I mean, it's meditation. There's the basically in a nutshell. That's what my sister said, and that's what I sort of said. And everything I've learned about in meditation has basically given me the tools to do this. I've I've, I've referred to this in the past as. Meditation has allowed me to inadvertently and sort of tertiarily become aware of my awareness and how I can sort of randomly and unpredictably uh, and not in a controlled sort of intentional way step outside myself, take an observer's perspective, and this happens in like a flash of light. But see that I'm doing a thing or feeling a thing or having an experience that's familiar, like being overwhelmed by sensory information of going down the hole, I don't know what I want, rabbit hole. I I see that happening now. And instead of inserting these automatic behaviors of the past, like in IFS, the parts or my old beliefs that I think are going to help me get through it because presumably I did it before and they helped because I'm still here, uh, instead of automatically knee-jerk reacting to these things, I can take a minute and go, I'm, there I am. And then the idea is that all the stuff I've learned 
can I can introduce new evidence and go, okay, I know normally what I do here is just like, you know, go along with the flow and, and say, I don't care where we eat. What do you want to do? Maybe this time I'll take a minute. You know what? I kind of cheeseburger. I want a cheeseburger. I'm going to try this. How about we go to the burger joint? Oh, everybody seemed to agree with that. Hmm, worked out pretty good. All of a sudden, I've, I've got a boundary. <laughs> I've enforced a boundary. Meditation has been the key to doing that. And it doesn't make any sense. And I think the reason people don't do it is because it seems stupid. I mean, at least exercising makes sense. If you force your muscles to bear a weight, it makes sense that over time your muscles will get better at bearing that weight. And it even kind of makes sense that your muscles might grow a little bit because they're used to bearing that weight. And so as much as you might hate pushing weights up, you might really want a, a, a much more muscular build. And so you do the things. Sometimes these things feel good and it's easy. Some people like running, so they run. And guess what? When you burn a lot of calories, more than you're taking in, you lose weight or you don't gain weight, right? It doesn't make sense. It, it seems like sitting quietly and doing whatever it is people think you do in meditation just makes you better at that. And who wants to, what, what good does that do? <laughs> but it turns out it's, meditation suffers from really bad marketing or, or really bad mismarketing or really misinterpreted views or, or people you know, filling in the blanks with what they think it is rather than actually trying it because I think meditation is more somatic. You can't intellectualize or analytically explain what meditation does to somebody. You have to demonstrate it. In order to demonstrate it, you got to get them to drink the Kool-Aid. And to drink the Kool-Aid, that means you have to commit to a practice over some period of time before you're going to see any changes. This is the, the root of all of our problems, which is why I mentioned before I want to do the addiction episode because it's like, why are we addicted to things? Uh, how do we break our addictions? We can make ourselves not drink alcohol. We can talk ourselves out of smoking cigarettes, but we never talk about why we do those things in the first place. You know, it's like, why, why do we meditate? What is the thing that we're trying to alleviate when we meditate? And, and you know, it's our awareness. Our awareness has been hijacked, especially today uh, in, in the attention algorithm YouTube society, right? We don't even know that it's happening. And so meditation is the only way I know of to help us become aware of our awareness. And uh, I'm reading um, John Kabat-Zinn right now, who is the guy who sort of <laughs> dumbed down or despiritualized Buddhism, and he might not like me saying this, in such a way that he could sell it to the American medical system. And he developed something that he calls uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's meditation, folks. And he got it in. He got funding, you know, to get it to be a part of hospitals, and he built his whole career on it. And I, and I honestly think it's genius, but I don't think there has to be so much trickery around it. But maybe there does, because we do have such a stigma about what meditation is. And he talks about the relationship between our attention, our intention, and our awareness. And I really am fascinated by how all of these things fit together and how those eventually become our, our values and our points of view and our needs. And guess what, folks? Our boundaries and our wants. All this stuff is, comes down to the, how we interpret the external stimuli that come into our environment. It's what it's for. The Buddha basically said, holy crap, the world is bombarding me with information that I can't process. How am I going to buy myself some chance in hell at being able to navigate this in a way where I don't just like suffer my way through and die? How do I get some agency in the world about my individuality, even though there is no duality, right? There's no individual. There's no connection. But yet there is, right? How do I do this life thing? And that's what he did. And that's what meditation became. That's what Buddhism became. And to a lesser extent, you know, Taoism and Hinduism and, and lots of other, probably all the religions ultimately find their way back to this idea of figuring out how to navigate the world as a human. And it all comes down to, and I don't know if awareness is the beginning 
or if it's attention, but if it, it's that sort of realization that I am alive. It's like Descartes doing all that work to get back to, well, I think, therefore, I am. It's like uh, Plato or Socrates saying, you know, an unexamined life is not worth living. It's the basic recognition that I exist. What did that? Consciousness. Maybe consciousness is the first thing. Um, but that's all we're doing in awareness is we're slowing the world down. We're devaluing. Instead of, so what happens with me, I receive infinite stim- stimulation from the world. As soon as I start to pay attention, I realize that I can't discriminate among any of it. And if I can't discriminate, what I do is I turn it up. I got to turn it up. I get hypervigilant. Oh, I got to pick the right thing. Okay, uh, you know, I, I, I try, like I do it to death, which, guess what? doesn't work. And so I think what meditation says in that sort of metaphorical context is it just says, I can let all this pass through me. I can accept, I can receive all of this stimulation. I can handle it. My nervous system evolves to do this very thing. What I'm doing wrong is attaching to it or thinking that there's any part of it that's more or less important than any other part, and that I've got to, you know, I get behind this idea that I got to make some decision. I got to do something besides just being in it, and that's where everything. That's what, <laughs> that's where all this shit falls apart. And granted, sometimes it's like I'm driving a car and I'm getting ready to go over the cliff, and I'm getting bombarded with all the sensory information, and I have to do something to turn the wheel and not die. You know, a lot of times we do have to do something. Our kids are, you know, do, getting ready to get into an unsafe situation where you have to do them away from it or whatever. Or maybe we don't. But, I mean, there are life and death things that require doing. But in this case, what I have learned, and none of it, if you told me this first, if you told me this, said you need to meditate because here's how it works, I would have been like, you are so full of shit and also give me whatever it is you're smoking. Uh, I, 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 I wouldn't be ready for it, and I don't expect anybody else to be ready for it. I'm just saying, put this in you know, the back of your pocket and pull out at a later date when you're thinking about maybe doing some meditation, is by having a, a meditation practice, and this really is a bigger practice and not just about meditation. It's about journaling and good habits and not smoking cigarettes and trying not to drink that much and eating good food and getting exercise for my body and my flexibility and my soul and playing music and listening to music and having good relationships, all this is part of the practice, but it all starts, as Dan Harris would say, on the cushion. Of course, I've never sat in the cushion because I can't sit down on the floor and cross my legs, which is why I'm doing yoga. But I have meditated probably the equivalent of 10 to 20 minutes a day for maybe four or five years over the last five to 12 years, or 10, yeah, five to 12 years, right? My practice has been really irregular, but it's been consistent, kind of like I played music for more than half of my life, but I'd go through periods, six, eight weeks, and never open a case. All my instruments stay in their cases. So I don't have to meditate every day, like Dan says, Dan Harris says, daily ish. But the there is kind of a baseline frequency, I think, that's required to get over the hump of what am I doing? This is all dumb. I, I, I'm not a meditator. This is stupid. Like, you, you just have to do it. I don't know, whatever they say it. Probably if you read like James Clear's Atomic Habits or learn about how long habits take, it's like 21 to 30 days of doing something daily-ish with some 10 to 15 minutes or something like that. You know, you you will eventually get it, and but but how much time that takes for people, you know, I I have no idea. If I could suggest anything for people who are interested in starting meditation, I would say go to YouTube, go on your podcast, find a one to three minute meditation. Ten uh, percent happier does this every week. They release like a seven minute meditation, which is really like three minutes of commercials. Don't get me started. Uh, and maybe four or five minute meditation. Do that four or five times a week for a month. You know, and you will, I almost can guarantee it, you will get pushed um, inadvertently over the hump. <laughs> and then, you know, that becomes your sort of the introduction, the entry point 
to mastering your awareness, which I think is one of a very few tenets, precepts, activities, actions that humans need to do in order to ex- have any chance at living, quote-unquote, a good life, quote-unquote, being happy, whatever it is that you want. It is also, the flip side of it, the lack of this capacity to even know that we're aware, I would say, is one of the top three causal agents involved in all of our problems, from suicide to war to really bad, you know, hindsight and never learning anything from history. All those things come down to we just really are fumbling our way through the world with no attention to what we're doing, no awareness of what we're doing, and no knowledge that we can actually choose things like our boundaries. And kind of to close with the boundaries thing, sometimes I don't wonder if boundaries aren't just completely accidental. Like, I, I think some people are just more assertive. I think some people are just more selfish than others. And, and, and from one perspective, good boundaries are just selfishness. Like, you're, you're, you know, it's like there's, I've always said there's a fine line between someone who's assertive and someone who's just plain narcissistic. So I don't know that that's the best definition of it, but it is important to understand what we want and what we need and who we are and what our values are in the world. And that comes first because without the, the, that, that foundation, you can't have relationships, you can't communicate, you can't make decisions. Anything that follows from the lack of that is just nonsense. And kind of that's, you look around the world and you wonder what's happening. There it is. <laughs> well, that's enough for now. Uh, thank you, Sophie, and thank you, my sister Lisa, for st- stimulating this episode, which I entitled, How Neurodivergent People Can Learn Healthy Boundaries. And really, it's meditation, folks. I hate to be the one to tell you. <laughs> but I am Chris Bircher. I am the Neurodivergent Professor. This has been episode 163 of my podcast and YouTube video channel. How do how neurodivergent people can learn healthy boundaries? I'll see you guys next week. Take it easy.